I'm Spencer Levy, and this is The Weekly Take. On this episode, we're delivering important insights into a sector that's looked like a sure thing even during this time of uncertainty in the economy at large. We're talking about industrial and logistics. I think it's the only one out of the various property types that doesn't have sort of big question marks as to where it's going to be, both in the short term and the long term. That's Ibrahim Bayan, an industrial economist with deep experience in the supply chain, who's now a leader in CBRE's Econometric Advisors Group. We're working on one project right now. We now have a signed letter of intent at you know probably 80% higher than they thought their value was as a retail site. And that's Mindy Listener, one of CBRE's veteran leaders in the industrial space, whose experience and expertise covers industries from car makers to retailers to industrial ice manufacturers and more. We've got the cold, hard facts and a wealth of deep analysis on this thriving sector. It's the whole package on industrial and logistics. That's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take, and I'm joined today by two of the leading industrial experts in the industry. First, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Mindy Listener, an executive vice president in industrial based in New Jersey. Mindy, welcome. Good afternoon, Spencer. Thank you for having me. And uh, my new colleague, uh, Ibrahim Bayan, who had joined us about six months ago, but has over a decade of experience in industrial, working for UPS and others, working on transportation issues, all squarely in the middle of the thick of things for industrial. Ibrahim, welcome. Thanks, Spencer. Glad to be here. Well, this might be the shortest podcast we've ever done because it's on industrial and it needs no introduction anymore in this space because things have been going so great. So, Mindy, why don't we start with you? How's industrial doing? Industrial is phenomenal. It's the busiest I've been in a very long time. Huge demand from both tenants and from landlords, everybody just watching a very robust market and looking for some advice as to uh, how to react, what to do, and uh, what should their next steps be. Same question to you. How's industrial doing? Yeah, I think industrial is doing very well, especially when you consider the overall macroeconomic backdrop where it seems like everything else is sort of falling off of the cliff, but industrial, I think, is maintained very well. Uh, and continues to perform at a very high level. Let me ask another question, and this is a very basic question, but I think it's for, important for our listeners to know, uh, what is industrial? In Europe, they call industrial sheds. Here, they call it industrial and logistics. So for the benefit of our listeners, Mindy, why don't we start with you? Explain what is industrial real estate and why it's maybe the most important asset class in real estate. So as opposed to a shed, some people refer to it as a box and a big box, which is different than retail big box, but um, industrial can come in many forms. It can be a, a big box warehouse distribution facility, which you know would mean high ceiling, lots of loading docks, lots of parking, um, whereas you have a fulfillment facility, which has a lot of the same features, but typically uh, a little bit of a different layout. And a fulfillment center typically needs a lot more car parking than trailer parking. Um, Then we can go into flex, which would be taking a large building and dividing it down to smaller spaces for smaller tenants, typically less loading, less parking, but higher office, uh, higher car parking. Then there's manufacturing and production space, which, you know, that's all about the power and um, labor and population. There are just a myriad of other forms, whether it's air freight, truck terminals, cold storage. So uh, industrial real estate has many faces. How closely tied at the hip are industrial and transportation? I think transportation is the backbone of industrial. Um, We we frequently talk to our clients about how real estate, you know, we used to say it was 5% of total costs, but as real estate and rents are growing so significantly, I would say that that's increasing. But when you package all of the costs into the analysis, at the end of the day, the largest cost that a client typically thinks about is transportation. So transportation is really uh, typically the ruling decision as to where and why a client will locate in a certain location. So Ibrahim, back to you. Now, talking about transportation Mm -hmm. and how important it is to the industrial sector, why don't you amplify your answer and how that worked while you were at UPS in terms of being one of the largest logistic companies in the world? Sure. I mean, you know, at, at a company like UPS, 
it's interesting to see because they touch so many different industries and they touch every country in the world. And so transportation flows uh, and how that sort of evolves plays a big role in their performance. And one of my big responsibilities there was just kind of trying to understand the sort of the new world for parcel demand that they were entering into over the last decade or so, where e-commerce was becoming such a big driver of their growth in package volume. And so understanding like, you know, how to read e-commerce trends, understanding, you know, what the elasticity is between these kinds of things. Like if e-commerce grows at a certain percentage, what does that mean for package volume growth? Uh, and just sort of how the, the logistics of e-commerce can differ from what you might consider more traditional kinds of supply chains. So when we say traditional supply chains, New Jersey is probably one of the great locations for having such great land, sea, and air uh, capabilities right there. Um, of those three capabilities, are they all intertwined or are there types of industrial that cater more to one or the other, Mindy? Oh, you forgot rail also, Spencer. So. Right, well, you see that? I didn't say drones either, so I missed one too. Planes, trains, and automobiles, and we could talk about drones later, but... Um, yeah. You know, I, I definitely think the driving force is trucks. Um, but you talk about the supply chains. It really is all component um, of, you know, how you're getting the product to the end user. Uh, some items may be flown. Uh, some may be sent by rail. And a lot of them are sent by truck. So when you're looking at the big picture, it's pretty diverse and very interesting. Well, Ibrahim, uh, it's not only diverse and interesting, it's also maybe the number one asset class in commercial real estate right now. Why is industrial doing so well right now? Um, I think just in general, when you look at sort of the things that drive industrial real estate demand, I think it's the only one out of the various property types that doesn't have sort of big question marks as to where it's going to be both in the short term and the long term. Like, you know, there's obviously the short term concerns about having like a massive drop off in economic activity. And I think that has some bearings on the industrial sector as well. But most of the other things that have come associated with this pandemic, I think, work in the favor of, of the industrial real estate uh, demand, again, both in the short term and the long term, and partially because of e-commerce, partially because uh, retailers, I think, are going to re reevaluate how much inventory they want to hold. And manufacturers are going to take a look at their supply chains, you know, analyze whether or not they need to hold more uh, on hand. Uh, and all of that, I think, is favorable for industrial. Whereas, like, you know, you look at office and you don't really know what exactly what the future of office is going to look like or what the future of retail stores is going to look like or even what cities look like and what that does to multifamily demand. Uh, I think it's, it, it, you know, most of the things, there aren't as many questions. There's questions as to how big the effects are going to be. But I think, uh, you know, directionally, it's all, it's all looking pretty rosy for industry. Well, my definition of rosy, to use a econometric advisor's model, which I read this morning, is that the forecast for industrial demand is better today than it was pre-COVID. Is that correct? No, absolutely. Um, and again, for some of the reasons I talked about, I think when this whole pandemic, you know, however it resolves itself, you know, when the dust settles and we return to things that look more normal, I think you're just going to be in an, in an environment where industrial is in a more demand than what it was. Well, Mindy, Ibrahim just gave a terrific macro answer. I'd like to get you to give a little bit of a, a micro perspective of Facts on the ground right now, because since you have such a diverse practice in industrial, in terms of sales, in terms of leasing, how's transaction volume? How are you getting deals done today, given the challenges of COVID? I mean, the transaction volume is is extremely robust. You know, I, I will say that I don't think I've ever been busier. You know, <laughs> not leaving at the house at the same time, just. Uh, you know, all day long, Zoom calls and, and getting inquiries and requests from both landlords and prospective tenants. Um, the, uh, you know, the demand continues. And I, I think it can be attributed to a couple different factors. One, again, is just the growth in e-commerce. Um, I think the stat for e-commerce is that for every $1 billion in e-com sales, you need an additional 1.2 million square feet of warehouse space. So with the expected growth of trillions in, in e-commerce, that just you know, equates to a, a lot of warehouse space being needed. Um, so, I mean, that's one aspect of it. The other, again, as Ibrahim had said, that uh, the COVID impacting um, some companies needing some safety stock, pack, ma making sure that uh, if another pandemic or crisis hits, that uh, this has been a, a big lesson. So a lot of apparel companies and retailers are making sure, you know, as well as other industries, making sure that they've got stock on hand and backup. Um, we've had a lot of inquiries from companies that are storing PPE. 
So including, you know, hospitals, Columbian Presbyterian has been in the market looking for a warehouse space for, you know, backup of ventilators and, and clothing and masks. So there's a lot of different dynamics that are, are driving um, demand. The only potential negative impact that I can see possibly is, you know, retailers that haven't really gotten their e-com platform off the ground. So I am watching the retail bankruptcies and trying to look at where are their distribution centers and what's going to come of those. But, you know, I, I think on, on the flip side, there's a lot of e-com users that are there just waiting to fill those buildings. Well, Mindy, let's let's get a little bit even more micro if we can. I know you do sales as well, but you don't just sell facilities. You also sell land. And so could you just dig into a little bit into the fundamentals? What's going on with values of land and industrial today? And talk a little bit about rents. Yeah, it's funny. I just had a conversation that um, I was invited to by two of our retail brokers um, who are working on a site that was is and was slated for industrial and mixed use. And now, like uh, many landlords are asking, you know, what 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 is the the you know the value or the use of my land as an industrial redevelopment? Because a lot of them have the same components. You've got you know proximity to populations and good access to roadways. And we've seen the the land values grow to pretty high numbers. You know, in New Jersey, depending on where you are, far south, it can be as low as a $40 or lower per buildable foot. If you get closer to New York, we've seen sites sell for over $200 per buildable foot. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the big variables, the land costs. And since the, Industrials in such demand, cap rates continue to push down. We're seeing cap rates at four and even below. Um, so we're looking at people being able to pay those prices. It has to be substantiated by rents, right? So rents at, you know, every, a lot of people know the exit 8A marketplace in New Jersey, which is a big box industrial marketplace where rents were uh, you know, probably 24 months ago in the 550 to $6 per square foot range. We're seeing leases being signed at $8, $8.50. I just heard somebody today was asking over $9 a square foot for rent. As you go north, those rents continue to go up. Well, Mindy, um, New Jersey is great, not just for industrial, uh, maybe not for our favorite football team, the, the New York JETS Jets, but we can talk more about that in a minute. But let's expand beyond New Jersey for just a moment, Ibrahim, taking some of the numbers that Mindy uh, gave us just a moment ago, $9 a square foot for industrial rents. Uh, that sounds like the, an incredible number. That's approaching 50% of an office rent in some markets. Um, is that sustainable? And how, does, how do rents look elsewhere in the United States? I do think rent growth is, is going to be fairly strong going forward, at least for the next five to 10 years. This kind of surge in e-commerce spend uh, and this increase in attention towards developing e-commerce operations, it puts upper pressure on all the costs associated with e-commerce. So not only the rents of the, of the warehouses and things like that, um, but transportation costs are, are likely going to uh, begin rising. You know, the other piece of it is that high rents also spurs construction activity. I expect that there's going to be a lot on, on sort of both on the, the supply and the demand side of industrial over the next couple of years um, with solid to strong rent growth along the way. Last week, we had on the show Dror Poleg, who's an author of a terrific book called Rethinking Real Estate. He said something about industrial that I want to get your take on. He said, the danger with industrial is that once something changes a little bit in the paradigm, they have no inherent kind of value. You know, they're just a shed near a highway somewhere. They're not near all sorts of other fun things. They're not near a lake or a river or a famous theater or a famous restaurant. Uh, so I do think that they're more risky than people currently assume. Ibrahim, do you agree or disagree with that quote? I just, uh, I, I, I guess I would say I generally disagree with it. Um, you know, when thinking about industrial space, I, you, you can kind of think of warehousing as being like connected to the general movement of goods throughout the economy, right? And so as long as people want goods and they want to, uh, they want to buy and, and produce goods, um, there's going to be a demand for some place to store it to get it from, from the manufacturer to the end consumer. And so as long as you know, online shopping is a big thing, um, there's going to be some, some support for industrial demand. So, Mindy, what do you think? Uh, if Drawer was on the show today, what would you say to him? And are industrial assets riskier than some people think? I think historically they may have been um, looked at that way. But at this point, I, I do think that they are not necessary evil, but necessary item in today's market. And um, 
there's product, it needs to be stored someplace and the demand you know, has been continuing and will continue. So just to kind of tag on to some of, <laughs> to some of this, um, there is some diversity in the performance of industrial over, over the past couple of quarters. Like it's not, it's not all roses. Um, the strength in the industrial right now is very much like the big bulk warehouse space. When you look at smaller industrial buildings, they haven't performed as well. Uh, and some of the other industrial types like manufacturing uh, areas, um, we actually saw negative net absorption in the second quarter, right? So, I mean, it was, it was very much just like a big bulk warehousing uh, strength story um, with some other areas of, of weakness in there. Just like the huge e-commerce retailers like Amazon, Walmart, Target, they're soaking up so much warehouse space, you know, rising tide lifts, lifts all boats, that kind of thing. Uh, but there are areas of, of softness inside of the industrial sector. Yeah, and I, I can add to that. I mean, a lot of it right now is the result of of what we're dealing with, our, our global pandemic. So, so you see how how something like that impacts the demand for um, pharma companies. Like, we're definitely seeing growth in demand for pharmaceutical companies. A company like uh, like Medline, who who manufactures syringes. Um, you know, on a huge growth tra trajectory. Another client of ours, um, a company called Novalex, that's a manufacturer of um, paper and plastic bags. Because of home delivery and because of, uh, of food and, and also just grocery stores where, you know, everybody wanted to get rid of plastic bags. Now you go into stores, you're getting plastic bags because people didn't want to touch paper. But it, it's had an interesting impact on all those different types of industries, corrugated, paper, plastic, um, food and beverage is huge. So uh, bottling companies, di different types of industries are being impacted and it's filling up warehouse space. That's one of the most important trends in real estate today, people converting to industrial. And I get it in terms of the old mall. Is it going to happen in strip centers where people are going to have industrial distribution in some of those places as well? Minnie, walk us through what's happening there. Yeah, I think there, there are two different phenomena when, it, when you come to looking at, at, at the mall and the retail space. So um, there's been some press out about, you know, our favorite large e-com company is looking to backfill some Sears and JCPenney stores and to use those as fulfillment. But we're also seeing, you know, a couple of, of older malls that are just, instead of being reused, you know, the, the buildings will be scraped and a new industrial building will be built. Uh, we're working on one project right now. We now have a signed letter of intent at, you know, probably 80% higher than they thought their value was as a, as a retail site. And the demand and the competition for it was crazy. So. Um, that's a site that's just going to get scraped and rebuilt. You see the same with office buildings as well that are going to be scraped and knocked down and, and just re, uh, reused as an industrial location. Well, let's talk about that as well in some high-density urban areas. So, Ibrahim, I'm going to talk to you now for about some of the larger industrial sites that I'm aware of in city locations, one in Brooklyn, one in Seattle, and they're building one in Wilmington that are multi-story, that are achieving rents that aren't that $9 level. They are north of $20 North of 30. Uh, score, thank you, Mitty. North of $30. By the, time, by the end of this call, it might be north of 40 Who knows? So, Ibrahim, is that the future of industrial and dense urban locations? I think it's part of it, certainly. I mean, the thing to note about industrial space in these big, dense urban locations is that there's not a lot of it uh, out there that's available, right? And, and, and so if you're looking at this landscape where the demand for it is, is significantly high, but there's not a lot of, of land to build on, and there's also not a lot of existing available space, uh, you know, you have to find solutions one way or another. Another way is just to build higher instead of sort of uh, building spread out. Um, and so I think when you look at some of these dense areas like uh, Los Angeles, where availability is just really low, you know, I think that's that's going to be part of the, the, the plan going forward. Mindy, are your clients talking about multi-story industrial? Yeah, I mean, so, some of our clients are building them. The question is, who can afford to pay those numbers? And I'm not kidding, you know, $30, $35 a square foot, including parking on the roof. You know, they're getting that kind of number for parking. But not everybody can afford to pay those numbers. Uh, I think it'll be a slow process getting all those buildings filled, a little bit slower than originally thought. But Ultimately, you know, especially as rents in northern Jersey continue to rise, it's going to help substantiate those rents. We're hearing from a lot of investors, uh, Ibrahim, uh, where you're based in Atlanta, 
Uh, we're seeing a, a big move of people to southeast United States, to the southwest, and we're seeing capital as well. How do those markets fare versus some of the more well-established northeastern or, or western markets? I think that's been a, a general trend over the last, say, decade or so. And as a result, it's also going to have implications for industrial demand. That if that's where the people are moving, that's where the jobs are moving, that's where manufacturing might be moving. Um, it, it's also going to be where retail spending and consumer spending just starts to shift with it. And so as a result, it's also going to help drive industrial demand associated with it. Let's go into one other issue, which is manufacturing. And manufacturing has certainly fallen off uh, in the United States, uh, but now we're talking about there might be some reshore and we might see a resurgence. So, Ibrahim, talk about what you think is going to happen in terms of reshoring of manufacturing and how that might impact industrial demand. You know, I always like to make a distinction between reshoring and nearshoring or just altering their supply chains because there's different answers depending on which one you're talking about. So. Uh, for certain, I, I think that the companies are going to reevaluate their supply chains and there are going to be some changes. Uh, and this is it's partially pandemic related, but really it starts with the trade war with China and sort of the tensions with China. Right. And so there was already a move like over, the, you know, over the past year and a half or so to kind of get away from China and, and, and sort of diversify supply chains. So the, the real question is like, OK, if you if you want to move production from China, where does it go? There's a decent argument that some of it comes back to the U.S., but I actually think most of it's either going to end up in some other southern, southeastern Asian nation uh, like Vietnam or something like that, or, or it ends up in Canada, Mexico, like close to the U.S., um, particularly Mexico, because the, the wages are like labor is still significantly cheaper in Mexico. And some of this is already in play. I don't know how much of it actually ends up ultimately in the U.S., um, you know, if it ends up going to like another Southeastern Asian nation, then there's probably not big changes in terms of industrial demand. If there's if there's shifts to Canada and Mexico, then you have to start looking at like a metro area by metro area, uh, because now you're not talking about like port movements coming in from the West Coast necessarily. You might be talking about movements across the border, um, and and that has different implications from one metro area to another. So you know the 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 areas that are closer to the border with Mexico, they probably see a boost. Uh, but the decreased reliance on China puts downward pressure on the, the markets that are, uh, you know, on the West Coast by the ports uh, there that, that get helped by global trade. Well, I, I know that uh, it's a big question about macro and geopolitics and where manufacturers is going. But let's now put our crystal balls in front of us and uh, ask our final wrap up question. So uh, this one may be a softball, but uh, since many of you have been in this business for a while, I'm going to ask you five years from now. On the 250th episode of The Weekly Take, the number one asset class in commercial real estate will be blank. Of course, it's going to be industrial. And I'll say it's probably at that point will be evidenced by the home of your old favorites, the Jets, MetLife Stadium. That's a phenomenal location for a distribution center. So we'll see <laughs> if, what do you say, 20 years from now, if that is still MetLife Stadium or if that's a... Uh, an Amazon Fulfillment Center. Same crystal ball question. Five years from now, Ibrahim, on the 250th episode of The Weekly Take, the number one asset class in commercial real estate will be blank. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be industrial. Like, it's sort of like I mentioned it earlier. The other property types have question marks that could go one way or another. And so there's a lot of uncertainty around them. But to me, industrial, I think, is pretty clearly going to be in a better position after the pandemic than it was before. And even before the pandemic, it was on a very strong trajectory uh, in there. And so to say, well, you know, we have this past five years of, of, of great activity and coming out of this, it's going to be even better over the next five years. Well, then, you know, I think that that pretty much explains it all. Well, I would say uh, what also explains it all is that every economic indicator uh, every uh, uh, large investor I've spoken to is backing up the truck on industrial today, so to speak. On behalf of the weekly take, Mindy Listener, Executive Vice President, CBRE, one of our truly great industrial experts. Mindy, thank you for joining the call. Thank you, Spencer. And Ibrahim Bayan, the lead industrial economist at our Econometric Advisors Unit, uh, who has been forecasting uh, industrial both for us, uh, for UPS and for others uh, for well over a decade. Ibrahim, thank you for joining the show. Thanks, Spencer. For more information, go to CBRE backslash The Weekly Take. Until next time, I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well.